look at that. These hands are coming out really nicely now. But I don't actually want to talk about the hand today. I'm going to go back to the skull. Right, um, so we were talking about the skull. So I thought I'd do a little bit more about the skull, but um, talk about the sutures, just go over the sutures, and some of the bony bits, the protuberances, the lumpy bits that we see, because um, they often get omitted. Often we use the names, the terms pop up, we talk about muscles attaching to this and ligaments attaching to that, and I'll try not to give you an exhaustive list of what attaches to things, I'll just try to point out the bony bits, um, so that when you come across those terms, you know what people are talking about, all right? Because there's quite a lot going on in here. All right, I got, I got a skull that's got colored bones, which is very helpful, and I've got a decent quality skull. Got my skeleton. They're always taller than me, these skeletons. So let's use this skull with the different colored bones on it, because it's quite easy to see where the sutures are generally, right? So here's the frontal bone. Here are the two parietal bones. Here's the occipital bone, and here's the temporal bone. Here's the maxilla, mandible, zygoma, and in red here, we've got the sphenoid bone. Um, and here are the nasal bones here, and, and so on. So here, separating the frontal bone from the parietal bones is the coronal suture. This is the coronal plane, right? Separating here in the midline, separating the two uh, parietal bones, is the sagittal suture. Sagittarius, the archer, firing arrows, right? So this is the sagittal plane. Um, and if we look at the back of the skull, so between, so here's the parietal bone, here's the occipital bone, this is the lambdoid suture. Now, lambdoid means Y-shaped. And if we look here, where these sutures meet, we get a Y shape. This is known as lambda. Um, so this gets called the lambdoid suture. Where these sutures meet here, kind of forming a T, this gets known as the bregma. And uh, in infants and in the fetus, we find two fontanelles here, right? So the bones, we have these large spaces between the bones, and there's also another suture here, the frontal suture in the fetal skull, which disappears in the adult. This is the anterior fontanelle and this is the posterior fontanelle. And what the fontanelles do is they allow the, uh, the rapidly expanding brain to grow uh, and the bone doesn't get in the way and it keeps up. Also during birth, there's a little bit of, you, you can, of molding of the, the bones can move around a little bit so the head can pass through the birth canal. But yeah, those fontanelles there. Between the parietal bone and the temporal bone, we have the squamosal suture here. This is the squamous, the flat part of the temporal bones. This is the squamous part of the temporal bone. And look at this process here. If we're going to talk about processes in a moment, this is the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. Uh, and here's the, zygoma, the zygoma here. And together they're forming the zygomatic arch. This being the zygoma, this gets called the temporal arch of the zygomatic bone, and they meet. Now down here, this is an example of why it's useful to know the parts, the bony parts. This here is the mastoid process. Can you see that? So, so here, that hole there is the external acoustic meatus, where we find the external, <laughs> the opening of the external ear there, the external acoustic meatus or the external auditory meatus. And here, see this bony point here? This is the styloid process, uh, and this is then the mastoid process. So if this is the occipital bone here, and this is the mastoid process here, this gets called, this suture here, the joint between the two, gets called the occipitomastoid suture. A little awkwardly maybe, this is the squamous part of the temporal bone, and this meets the sphenoid bone here, and this gets called the sphenosquamous suture here. And there's, you see that little suture there? So here's the parietal bone, here's the, the sphenoid bone, and there's a, there's a little short suture there. Um, so this is the sphenoparietal suture in there. So then here, of course, here's the frontal bone, here's the sphenoid bone, so this is the sphenofrontal suture here. And we can also see, look, we've got these other bony lumps here, which, there we go, that's a bit better. 
Unfortunately, this is yellow. This is kind of a, a mustard yellow, but we've got these two colors next to each other, so it's not super clear. But here's the zygoma, here's the frontal bone. So this is the zygomatic process here of the frontal bone. And this is the frontal process of the zygomatic bone. If you wanted to talk about the maxilla, you could do similarly. So as you see, this process here, this process of the maxilla passing to the zygoma would be the zygomatic process of the maxilla. And this process here extending up to the frontal bone, this would be the frontal process of the maxilla. Now we've talked about these bones here we, uh, within the orbit. We, so we've talked about the bones, of the, there's another video about uh, the bones of the nasal cavity in here. So we include these bits, the lacrimal bone and the nasal bones. But if we go deeper inside the orbit, we've got another yellow bone in there. Do you see how this is mustard? <laughs> so this is the frontal bone. This is the, the zygoma. And in here, can you see there's that other yellow bone? It's not very helpful, is it? They could have, could have picked more colors. But it's, it's this bone here. Hang on. There you go. And my lighting could be a bit better, but you might be able to hear the pitter patter of rain outside. It's dark. I've left this a bit late. But you see this bone here? So that's the ethmoid bone. And at the back of the orbit, we can see the red of the sphenoid bone. So these sutures are, I mean, they're not very wiggly on this skull. But on this skull and other skulls you look at, the sutures are... See on this skull, the, the sutures are very tortuous. They vary between people, but the purpose of the suture is to form a tight, a very tight kind of interdigitated joint between the bones of the skull. Then These are joints that don't move, um, so they're protecting the contents inside. So if we turn the skull around, there are a few features on the occipital bone as well. Hopefully you can see some of the lumps and bumps here. Um, back here, and you can, you can usually palpate it on the back of your head, you've got a lump. And this is the external occipital protuberance here. And there are a couple of lines. There are superior nuchal lines and inferior nuchal lines. Um, difficult to see in 2D, but there's the lump there. So there's an external occipital protuberance and often a crest running from it. And you can see, can you see these lines here? And there are lines here. And these are obviously attachment sites for structures in the neck, which lift your head up and support your head and that sort of thing. Of course, if there's an external occipital protuberance, there's gonna be an internal occipital protuberance. And if we open up and look inside, here, occipital protuberance in there. Just so another, get another lump. And of course, if we're inside the skull here, we should probably talk about some of the shapes in here. Can you see how we've got a fossa here, we have a fossa here, and we have a fossa here. So up here, this is the anterior, cra anterior cranial fossa. Here, we have the middle cranial fossa on either side, and back here is the posterior cranial fossa. And in here, we find the sphenoid bone. Um, don't really, so you can see the sphenoid bone there in red in the middle. So here's foramen magnum. So here, and if you study a skull, you'll see the sutures are surrounding the edge of the sphenoid bone in here, right in the middle. We talked about uh, the cribriform plate and the cristagalli up here and we looked at the internal carotid artery as it appeared here. Now here, this depression is the cella turcica, the Turk saddle. This is, uh, and the deep part in here is the hypophyseal fossa and this is where the pituitary gland sits, surrounded by all of this bone. And we have um, clenoid processes around here. So these two here, are the anterior clenoid processes. And you can see that they're forming this, they're forming a, uh, uh, they're forming a, a groove, a tube through which the internal carotid artery passes and pops up about here. Um, we have a middle 
clenoid process kind of in here and this is the posterior clenoid process here. Of the cella tersica we also talk about the dorsum celli as this wall here. The posterior wall is the dorsum celli and the anterior wall is the uh, tuberculum cella. So around here we have there's the the optic canal passes through there. Um, you see this slope here, this slope here, we have a slope and this is called the clevis, clevis literally from the words meaning slope, so we have this slope here and on the clevis this is where we find the basilar artery, um, giving off lots of pontine arteries, the pons is here, um, so blood vessels are coming in here towards the circle of Willis from the foramen magnum. So there's clevis. Um, this we talked about, this lumpy part, part of bone here is the petrous part of the temporal bone. So on the inside, the petrous part of the temporal bone in here has the inner ear structures within it. Remember that all of these grooves and processes and lumps and bumps that we're looking at here have a purpose and the reason that they're there. Many of the grooves are formed by blood vessels um, next to the bone, these meningeal arteries. And some of them, like the, the groove we see formed by the internal carotid artery, leave some lovely shapes. And the holes are there for blood vessels and cranial nerves to pass through. These other lumps and bumps, which might not be immediately apparent what they do or why they're there, they're attachment points for... Um, for the dura mater, for the thick connective coverings of the brain. So Mark was removing some brains from some bodies this week and um, one of the things Mark has to do is, is not just remove the, the skull cap, the calvarium, but when he goes in he cuts the cranial nerves as, as close as he can um, so we have as much nerve on the brain as possible, but also he, he needs to go deep and find these edges and cut along here, along the edges of the reflections of the, of the thick connective tissues of the, um, the dura mater, which are holding the brain down. So the tentorium cerebelli here holds down the cerebellum beneath it and what have you. So that's why there are lumps and bumps here. That's what these clenoid processes are for. We have bits of dura mater attaching to them, holding it all in place. And the dura mater, of course, supports the brain and the, the dural venous sinuses. I, I mentioned the, the, the styloid process here and the number of structures passed from it, like the stylohyoid ligament to that, to the floating hyoid bone here. So the stylohyoid ligament passes from the styloid process to the hyoid bone. Now the styloid process is um, bolstered a bit on these plastic skulls because when skulls get dropped, that's the thing that usually breaks. Like here's the styloid process here. This skull has been dropped and it's lost the styloid process on the other side. So when you're looking at skulls, watch out for that. Um, but also down here, we have a number of interesting shapes around here, right? So here's the nasal cavity opening posteriorly. So you can see the conchi in there, you can see those curves of bone. Um, we've got these, look at these wing shaped bits of bone here. So these are the pterygoid processes, and there are two on either side. And pterygoid comes from the word meaning wings. These are wings of bone, like the pterodactyl. Um, and there is a lateral plate and a medial plate for each. And if you think about the muscles of mastication, the, uh, the pterygoids, the muscles that are the lateral and medial pterygoids, they, they attach here. Oops. So what bone do the pterygoid plates come from? Hmm. Let's have a look. Look, you can see how here's the sphenoid bone. So the pterygoid plates, the pterygoid processes, are part of the sphenoid bone. And you can see Voma in there. Um, and here's the foramen ovale. So this is where you'll find the otic ganglion just around here and a whole bunch of nerves dropping out and running around. And then we've got the muscles. Here's the palate. So up here we've got the hard palate. And you can see that the purple is the maxilla. But there's another red here, and that's not actually the sphenoid bone. This red, this is, this is a, a palatine bone on either, either side. So we've got 
the maxilla, the, and then we've got two palatine bones forming the hard palate, and then we've got the sphenoid bone back here. So watch out for those. And there are a number of foramina in here. You can see there's a larger hole here, and there's usually a couple of smaller holes here, and this is the greater palatine foramen, the bigger one, and the smaller ones are the lesser palatine foramina. And you've got um, nerves of the palate and nasal cavity looping around, and blood vessels looping around here through these holes. Um, up here, there's another foramen in the palate, and that hole there, that's the incisive fossa. What we've got here are lots of joins between the occipital bone, the sphenoid bone, and the temporal bone. And the cracks of bone that we see here, um, we have a, a pterygoid canal that opens near the pterygoid plates um, through various, which various structures pass through. So these cracks of bone here are the opening of the pterygoid canal. Very difficult to see. They're there, but it's very difficult to actually see, you know, the entire canal or really parts of it, just to know that the openings are there. If we take the mandible off, of course, on these skulls, this is the mandibular fossa. So we have a depression in here. So, but this depression, of course, is filled with a bit of, a bit of plastic in these models. So this is the, the mandibular fossa. You see where we are? So here's the, there's the mastoid process. Here's the um, zygomatic process of the temporal bone. And in here then, that's the mandibular fossa, which the mandible is going to articulate with. So we've got the condylar process, which is the articulating part. And then we've got the coronoid process up here, which the masseter muscle inserts into. And um, we have the body down here, the angle where it changes angle, and then the ramus up here. Ramus meaning branch, but it's flattened part. And we can see here on this model, we've got uh, a nerve, the inferior alveolar nerve, and we've got blood vessels passing into the mandibular foramen, which are then going to run to the lower teeth and then out here through the mental foramen, um, which is this foramen here. There's a groove in here for the mylohyoid muscle, which is forming the floor here. And this notch in between the condylar process and the coronoid process is the, uh, the mandibular notch. So you guys know the names of the bones. We've looked at so the sutures and where the sutures meet. Oh, the one thing I did mention is where these sutures meet here, that we were talking about, right? We have this, all these sutures coming together here. This is the pterion, P-T-E-R-I-O-N, pterion, pterion, pterygoids. So we're talking about wings again, aren't we? But that's the pterion, that space there. So we've got that weakness where the bone gets thin and you have all those sutures meeting. Um, so we've talked about the sutures, we've talked about the bones, and I've talked about as many lumpy bumpy bits on here as I can think of, and I didn't really want to talk about what attaches to what, or what goes through what, as we were talking about it too much, because then we'll go down a rabbit hole and we'll never come out. Um, but I wanted to go over the terms, because these terms often get thrown up, and students are blank, you know, what, I don't know what that means. So if you've heard the term and you've seen the term, when it gets brought up somewhere else, you'll know what we're talking about. We're talking about the cranial fossae and all these bits and bobs in here, right? There are other bits and bobs on here, but you know, that's already extending on what we were talking about last time and what we'll often talk about in teaching. We often don't go into that much detail, um, but there's a bit more detail and you'll find more detail if you study a skull. Um, so good luck, spend some time with these things.